Hello. I think I'm on. Something's looking weird here. Oh, I see. Okay, something was going strange there. Hey, how's everybody doing? It's good to see you tonight. I am glad that we are able to be together, and I thank you for watching in for this Bible class. Kids, let's sing together. The B-I-B-L-E, yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the Word of God, the B-I-B-L-E, Bible. And let's sing, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. And then let's sing, oh, let's sing about um, uh, the books of the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts and a letter to the Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians and Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus and Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st and 2nd and 3rd John, Jude and Revelation. All right, we're studying in the book of Genesis, so I'm going to sing some of those creation songs. Let's start with how God is big enough to do anything that he wants. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. My God is so big. So strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. The mountains are his, the valleys are his, the trees are his handiwork too. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. And let's do that creepy caterpillar song. Creepy caterpillar climbing in a tree. He wiggled short, he wiggled long, he wiggled right at me. Put him in a box, don't go away, I said. When I opened up the box, a butterfly instead. I could never make one, even if I tried. Only God in heaven can make a butterfly. Slimy little tadpole, swimming in a lake. He wiggled short, he wiggled long, he wiggled like a snake. Put him in a jar, don't go away, I said. When I opened up the jar, a frog jumped out instead. I could never make one, even if I tried. Only God in heaven can make a frog jump high. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim his handiwork. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim his handiwork. Day unto day utter speech. And night unto night reveals knowledge, day unto day utter speech. And night unto night reveals knowledge, heavens declare the glory of God. The heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim his handiwork. The heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim his handiwork. Day one, day one, God made light when there was none. Day one, day one, God made light when there was none. Day two, day two, God made the sea and sky of blue. Day two, day two, God made the sea and sky of blue. Day three, day three, God made the land and flowers and trees. Day three, day three, God made the land and flowers and trees. Day four, day four, sun and moon and stars galore. Day four, day four. Sun and moon and stars galore. Five, day five, God made the birds and fish alive. Day five, day five, God made the birds and fish alive. Six, day, six, day, God made beasts and man that day. Six, day, six, day, God made beasts and man that day. Day seven, day seven, God rested in his heaven. Day seven, day seven, God rested in his heaven. Boys and girls in your Bible class. Be very, 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 very quiet. Boys and girls in your Bible class, be very, 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 very quiet. For God loves you and I love you and your teacher loves you too. When you go to class, your teacher will tell you all that God has done for you. Boys and girls in your Bible class, be very, 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 very quiet. Boys and girls in your Bible class, be very, 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 very quiet. 
For God loves you and I love you and your teacher loves you too. When you go to class, your teacher will tell you all that God has done for you. Boys and girls in your Bible class, be very, 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 very quiet. Boys and girls in your Bible class, be very, very, sh very, very sh quiet. All right, on these green cards, last week we learned about the creation in Genesis chapters 1 and 2 and the first sin in Genesis chapter 3. We had a song that helped us remember some of those lessons. Bear with me. Let's sing that song, and then I'll go through the lessons. Oh, Adam was a busy man, naming all of the creatures. He became a type of Christ, but with a difference in features. He brought sin into the world, but Christ takes it away. Oh, Adam was a man of sin, but Christ the man of forgiveness. Now let me back up. You know what that means? Adam brought sin into the world. He was the first man to sin. Christ became the first man that was ever, and the only man ever able to take sin away by sacrifice. Let's sing it again. Oh, Adam was a busy man, naming all of the creatures. He became a type of Christ, but with a difference in features. He brought sin into the world, but Christ takes it away. Oh, Adam was a man of sin, but Christ a man of forgiveness. And then the second verse about Adam's marriage, Adam and Eve, the first husband and wife. Oh, Adam was a married man, though he first was lonely. God said sleep and then took a rib, formed it into a lady. Loved then overwhelmed his soul and he would cling to her. Oh, bone of bones and flesh of flesh, family one of the living. That's what happened. God brought all the animals to Adam to name. He named all the creatures and then there wasn't found a helper that was good for him. So God put Adam in a deep sleep, took one of his ribs out and made a woman out of that. And Adam was so excited. He said, bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Oh, Adam was a married man, though he first was lonely. God said sleep and then took a rib, formed it into a lady. Love then overwhelmed his soul and he would cling to her. Oh, bone of bones and flesh of flesh, family one of the living. Oh, Adam was no caveman. He knew which was the bad tree. He knew well what God had said, but a serpent deceived Eve. She gave him the fruit to eat, and that was that that day. Oh, he was booted from paradise. Sweaty work was his repay. Do you remember how the first sin happened? God told Adam, don't eat of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You can eat of every other tree in the garden, but don't eat of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He knew that. He understood that. He wasn't just a caveman. He understood that. But the serpent came along and said to Eve, did God really say you can't eat of that? So she saw that the tree was good for food, it was pleasant to the eyes, a tree desirable to make one wise. And she took of it and ate and gave to Adam and he ate. And then they had to leave the Garden of Eden because God had said that they die. So now they can't have access to the tree of life anymore in the Garden of Eden. Oh, Adam was no cave man. He knew which was the bad tree. He knew well what God had said. But a serpent deceived Eve. She gave him the fruit to eat, and that was that that day. Oh, he was booted from paradise. Sweaty work was his repay. He had to work hard and get through thorns and thistles, and by the sweat of his brow, he would make his living. Oh, in the image of God was man, Adam first and then woman. Over animals they did reign, not evolving from vermin. They were given all the earth to rule and work and play. Oh, made much higher than all the apes. We are gloriously human. Oh, yes, that's the whole picture. We're made in the image of God. And God gave us dominion over the earth, over the animals. So we have charge of them. And we're not just made higher than the apes. We didn't evolve from rats or vermin or apes. We're made just a little bit lower than the angels. We're in the image of God. Oh, in the image of God was man, 
Adam first and then woman. Over animals they did reign, not evolving from vermin. They were given all the earth to rule and work and play. Oh, made much higher than all the apes, we are gloriously human. All right, now for tonight's lesson, we go to Genesis chapter 3, no, sorry, Genesis chapter 4, and then Genesis chapter 5. A very, very sad story takes place in Genesis chapter 4. Cain is born to Adam and Eve, one of their sons. Abel is born to Adam and Eve, one of their sons. Now, Cain would bring an offering to God from what he did. He tilled the ground for a living. He had plants and vegetables. He brought an offering to God of those plants and vegetables. Abel was a keeper of animals, and he brought one of those animals as an offering to God. Well, Abel apparently followed God's instructions, and Cain didn't, because God was pleased with what Abel brought and was not pleased with what Cain brought. Well, Cain sinned. Cain sinned by not doing what God wanted in worship, and then he got mad about it. Instead of repenting, instead of saying, I'm sorry, I won't do it anymore, instead of doing that, he said, Oh, I'm just mad at Abel. And he got so mad at Abel that you know what he did? He killed him. Oh, that's so awful. So evil. So bad. Cain killed Abel. And then God had to deal with Cain and, and punish him. But then Adam and Eve had another son named Seth. And in the meantime, they're having more sons and daughters. It would seem Genesis chapter 5 verse 4 said they had many sons and daughters. After all, Eve was the mother of all living, Genesis chapter 3, verse 20. So these sons and daughters would then populate the earth, and they create big, big, build great populations, they build big cities. But Seth was the one that came after Cain and Abel, and Seth is so important. Do you know why? The genealogy of Christ traces down to Seth. Genealogy, you know what that means? That means, well, if I have a son... And I do, Andrew Jackson Robinson V, and he has a son, Andrew Jackson Robinson VI. That's my genealogy. And then I could go to Andrew Jackson Robinson III, or uh, you go on my wife's side. Her mom is, is Shirley Tubbs, and her daughter, uh, my wife's daughter, my, mine and my wife's daughter is Hannah Robinson. If she has kids, they'll be in our genealogy. That's what a genealogy means. It's your family tree. Well, the family tree of Jesus Christ started right back here with Adam and then with Seth. And Seth, then has Enosh, and Enosh has Canaan, and Mahalalel, and Mahalalel has Canaan, I forget which one, and Mahalalel has, Canaan has Mahalalel, Mahalalel has Jared, and Jared has Enoch, and that's in Genesis chapter 5. Enoch lived to be 365 years old. They did back then. The earth wasn't so corrupt, there weren't so many problems in the earth, so they lived to be really old ages. Enoch lived to be 365 years old, and then, guess what? He didn't die. He just was not. He apparently just went up to be with God. He just walked and was not. Maybe that was a reward for how he lived. I don't know. But then Enoch had a son named Methuselah. And Methuselah is the oldest living person that ever lived on the face of the earth. Do you know how old Methuselah lived to be? 969 years old. That's even older than I am. 969. That was Methuselah. So Enoch lived to be 365, and then he walked with God and was not. And Methuselah lived to be 969, and they were in the genealogy of Christ. Let me see if I can get it right for you. There was Adam, and then there was Seth, and then there was Enosh, and then there was Canaan, and then there was Mahalalel, and then there was Jared, and then there was Enoch, and then there was Methuselah. So that's how it worked out. And it goes on down through King David, and it comes on down to Jesus Christ several a few thousand years later. And it all connects back here in Genesis. Do you know what Genesis means? It's the book of beginnings. This is where we learn all about our beginnings, mankind's beginnings. Genesis 1 and 2, creation. Genesis 3, the first sin. Genesis 4, Cain, Abel, and Seth. Genesis 5, Enoch and Methuselah. Let's do it again. Genesis 1 and 2, creation. Genesis 3, the first sin. Genesis 4, Cain, Abel, and Seth. And Genesis 5, 
Enoch and Methuselah. Now, next week, we'll work on the next couple on the green card. You keep studying it, okay? Do you know, little child, what is in you? Can you dream, little child, of going far? Do you know, little child, of the power you've been given? Do you know, little child, whose you are? You were made in the image, in the image of God, just a little bit below the angels. And the masterpiece of heaven's hand is your body and your soul. You were made in the image, you were made in the image, you were made in the image of God, in the image of God. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for each little child here. Help them to grow up realizing that you that they are the way you made them, because that's the way you know best for them. And help them to follow your instructions so that they know what is good for them. Help them to listen to their moms and dads and grandparents now so that they can learn from the Bible. Thank you for the Bible. And thank you for Jesus. And thank you for planning for us all along. Help us never to be bad people like Cain was in killing his brother. Help us never even to say mean things to people, but correct them if they're wrong, kindly and lovingly. And we pray that you'll help us all to be good people. Thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you, kids, for joining us this week. We really appreciate it. Really appreciate it. Teens and adults, I keep becoming distracted because my Facebook Feed says that I've been online for three hours and seven minutes and 34, 35, 36 seconds. And I don't think I have, so I'm wondering what I did wrong this time. I hope you're getting the feed all right. We're in Daniel chapter 3, if you'd like to turn there, please. Daniel chapter 3. Remember that in Daniel chapter 1, we read about Daniel who, when the first captivity took place in 605 B.C., along with his three friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, were taken captive to Babylon. They were given Babylonian names, Belteshazzar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And right from the get-go, they had to deal with being godly people in a pagan society. They had to have a challenge with King Nebuchadnezzar over what they would eat because they didn't want to break any of their food laws. And finally, Nebuchadnezzar relented to allow them to eat what they wanted to eat. In Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream and nobody can interpret it for him. So he gets angry and he's going to destroy all his supposed spiritual men, the uh, astrologers and sorcerers and all of those, including Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But then Daniel finally has a vision, or God tells him, rather the interpretation of the dream. Daniel thanks God and goes to Nebuchadnezzar and tells him the interpretation of the dream. The interpretation of the dream was not just any dream. It was a prophecy about Christ and his kingdom, the church. There would be the Babylonian kingdom represented by a head of gold on a statue. There would be the Medo-Persian kingdom represented by a chest and arms of silver on that statue, on that image. And then there would be the Grecian kingdom represented by belly and thighs of bronze on that image. And then there would be the Roman kingdom whose feet were iron or legs were iron and feet partly of iron and partly of clay. Then there was a stone cut out of the mountain without hands that crushed against that image and broke it all in pieces. And that stone represented a kingdom that would be set up during the days of the Roman kingdom, but it would never be left to other people. It would endure forever and it, it would always be God's kingdom. And that's the kingdom of Christ. It was established during the days of the Roman kingdom when Christ died on the cross, was resurrected from the dead, ascended to heaven, and then 50 days later was preached in Jerusalem as resurrected from the dead. And 3,000 people reenacted the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ to become Christians that day. They were baptized into Christ. Now in Daniel chapter 3, it's probably just a little bit later. We're not given a date for this chapter. It's probably just about 603, 602 BC, somewhere in there, while Daniel is still young, and there's a very challenging situation that happens. Let's read. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its width 6 cubits. That's tall. That's probably about 90 feet tall. Uh, nine stories, almost as tall as the Golden Towers down here in Moundsville. And then it was about 
six cubits wide or about nine feet, ten feet wide, something like that. And so that's pretty big, especially if it's not sitting in the mountains, but it's standing on a level plain on flat land and it towers up above everybody. It was an impressive statue and it was made of gold, which even made it sizzle in the sun and made people be more in awe of it. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And King Nebuchadnezzar sent word to gather together the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. We're going to have a big to-do, a celebration to dedicate this image, and I want all the government officials to be here. It would be today as if our president called all the governors, all the senators, all the House of Representatives, maybe even all the state senators and state representatives to Washington, D.C. for some sort of celebration. That's what Nebuchadnezzar is doing. Verse 3. So the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered together for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald cried aloud. Here's an announcement to this crowd of people gathered at this statue. To you it is commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, because Babylon had encompassed a lot of different peoples, nations, and languages. To you it is commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery, and symphony with all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the gold image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Now you know who's going to have trouble with this, don't you? Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would have trouble with this. We read about them. Although Daniel's not in this story. We don't know where Daniel is. Maybe he was away in a different country on business at the time. We don't know, but Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are at the heart of this story. They are good Jewish people. They know not to be idolaters. Jewish people had been idolaters, but God had really kind of cured them of that with the, with the, uh, with the captivity. Well, the, the rest of the people weren't cured yet because the complete captivity hadn't come. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were going to be conscientious, and they didn't want to bow down to this false god. The real god would not like that. The real god would be punishing them for such a thing. And they loved their God and they wanted to serve him, so they're not going to do that. Now, that puts them in quite a predicament, doesn't it? Obey the government or be burned in a burning fiery furnace. Those are our choices. So at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the horn, flute, harp, and lyre and symphony with all kinds of music all the people nations and languages fell down and worshiped the gold image which king nebuchadnezzar had set up therefore at that time certain chaldeans came forward and accused the jews they spoke and said to the king king nebuchadnezzar O king live forever people couldn't just mind their own business they had to notice that shadrach meshach and abednego didn't bow down so they go tattle on them you, O king, verse 10, have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery, and symphony with all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the gold image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Remember that, king? Remember you said that? Yeah, okay, I said that. Then they said, there are certain Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon... See, there's a little tinge of jealousy in there, isn't there? There are Jews that you've set over the affairs of the province of Babylon. They were elevated in chapter 1. Remember that? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not paid due regard to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold image which you have set up. It made Nebuchadnezzar angry. He was the king. and People were supposed to do what he said. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and fury, gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I have set up? Is that true? Now, if you are ready at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery, and symphony with all kinds of music, and you fall down and worship the image which I have made, good. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Then he says something that's really blasphemous. 
He asks them the question rhetorically. He thinks, and who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? Oh, he's putting himself up there in pride. Is there any God that could deliver you from my hands? I'm the king of the world. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. Now that's bold, isn't it? We really don't need to answer you. You're the king, but we don't really need to answer you. If that is the case, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Our God is able to deliver us, but if he does not deliver us, we're still not bowing down to your statue. That's pretty bold. In 1940, many of you probably know this story, during the beginning of World War II, the Allied forces were backed up on the beaches of Dunkirk after the Nazis had run over them in France. They were backed up with their, seat, with their backs against the English Channel and the Nazis coming down on them. There, you may have seen the movie about it. You may have read books about it. There's one little detail that's sometimes left out. When they were backed up like that, there wasn't much signal, is my understanding. Three words were sent through on the telegraph to the headquarters in England. But if not. The headquarters in England knew what that meant. The people of England knew what that meant because they studied their Bibles. They all knew that those three little one syllable, not more than three letter words were from Daniel chapter three. But if not. In other words, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, we're not giving in to your demands. These soldiers were saying, we're not giving in to the Nazis. Even if they kill us all, even if we're not delivered, we're not giving in. Well, you know what happened after that. The people across the channel in their fishing boats, their yachts, and everything that they could find came across there unorganized, and rescued almost all of those soldiers before the Nazis got to them. You wonder if Providence was involved. But if not. In Daniel chapter 3, what Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were doing was standing up to ungodly government officials. Now we know, and we've been over this before, that we're supposed to obey the government. Romans chapter 13, 1 Peter chapter 2. Even if there are laws we don't like, I'll get to the other obvious thing in a minute, but that always taught me, if there's a law you don't like, obey it. Work to change it, but you still obey it. But there's one exception to even all of that, and that is what Peter said in Acts chapter 5, verse 29. We ought to obey God rather than men. Now you think, we're really thankful that we don't have a situation, and I'm really thankful that we don't have a situation where we have to bow down to a statue, or be thrown into a burning, fiery furnace. But there are parallels that take place at different times throughout history. When ISIS was running rampant over the Middle East before 2016, there were many beheadings and slayings of different kinds, and some reports even said crucifixions, of people who just wouldn't convert to Islam, wouldn't convert to radical Islam. Because they held to Christianity, they were slain. And things aren't so drastic in some other places, but sometimes Christians are pitted against some government decrees. Let me tell you some things that are happening in this country that we're on the verge of, of being persecuted for our beliefs. In the area of homosexuality, you probably heard of Jack Phillips, Baron L. Stultzman. Jack ran a, a, a bakery, refused to bake a cake for a couple that was having a same-sex wedding, spent from 2012 up till pretty recently in court at the Supreme Court a couple of times, I think, at least once, defending his right to a religious freedom of conscience. Baronel Stutzman did the same thing regarding florists. They didn't hate these people. They served them. They loved them, but they couldn't in good conscience serve a same-sex wedding. Memories Pizza in Indiana said that they wouldn't cater a same-sex wedding, and they 
had so many death threats and harassments that they had to shut down for a couple of weeks before they could open back up and the media storm passed. Well, some people will say, just bake the cake. Just come on, just bake the cake, even though you're a Christian. Well, that's not the point. There might be differences of conscience on that sort of thing, and maybe some Christians would bake the cake. The point is that there might be a point where government infringes upon religious conscience. I mean, think, think about it in other terms. What if there's someone who is LGBT who owns a bakery? Could they be forced to make a cake that says homosexuality is a sin? Do you want that? I don't want that. I don't want to force them to do that. What if there's a Muslim owned grocery? Do you want to set, force them to sell pork? Pork is unclean to them. Well, they won't serve me pork. I need to sue them. Nobody thinks of that. But here it takes place against Christians. In Kentucky, a couple of employees didn't want to wear a rainbow heart that supported, in their view, the LGBT movement. So they were fired. Under the last administration, the Equal Opportunity Employment Commission filed a suit on their behalf, and I don't know where that stands now. The, there are numerous cases out there of bakers and florists and videographers and calligraphers in the same place, having their conscience versus what the government says. A lot of it came to fruition in 2015 when the Supreme Court decided the case of Obergefell versus Hodges, which legalized same-sex marriage nationwide. Remember, at that time, Kim Davis was a county clerk in Kentucky who refused to issue marriage licenses at all because it went against her conscience to issue same-sex marriage licenses. Well, she'd been in court ever since. You don't see that on the headlines too much, but she's been in court ever since. Just a few weeks ago, the Supreme Court rejected an appeal that would have cleared her name, and now they've opened the door for her to be uh, continuously sued by some people regarding those things. Clarence Thomas said about this particular case, Davis may have been one of the first victims of this court's cavalier treatment of religion in its Obergefell decision, but she will not be the last. Due to Obergefell, those with sincerely held religious beliefs concerning marriage will find it increasingly difficult to participate in society without running afoul of Obergefell and its effect on other anti-discrimination laws. Moreover, Obergefell enables courts and governments to brand religious adherents who believe that marriage is between one and man and one woman as bigots, making their religious liberty concerns that much easier to dismiss. Justice Clarence Thomas says they're just going to start branding us religious bigots and they'll dismiss our religious freedoms. Rod Dreher is the author of a book called Live Not By Lies. In an interview with Rob Bluey, he spoke of an evangelical preacher named David Gushy, who a few years ago flipped from being against same-sex marriage to being for same-sex marriage. And at the time, he wrote a column warning fellow Christians that this issue is going to find you wherever you are. You'll not be able to be neutral about it. Gushy believed that Christians should support LGBT in all possible ways, he said the only obstacles in the way to full LGBT acceptance are conservative Christians. The conservative Christians love everyone, but will not agree with everyone. Conservative Christians will not harass or persecute anyone, but still don't they have the right to some religious conscience protections? The, the human rights campaign submitted to the new administration a blueprint for positive change in which they suggest, one of their 85 suggestions is that religious colleges and universities be stripped of their accreditation, basically if they don't support transgender and homosexual policies. Uh, the way they word it is if they do not meet non-discrimination policies and science-based curricula standards. You know, everybody says follow the science, but the science changes from week to week, it seems, with these people. And uh, science one week says there are this many genders, and the science another week says there are that many genders. That's what they mean by that. So religious institutions of any kind are in danger if this human rights campaign recommendation is taken up. I think sometime this week, the House is supposed to vote on the Equality Act, which sounds wonderful. But what it would do is nationalize some things that have already taken place at a local level. On a local level, Charities have been run out of business if they're based on Christian principles. Adoption agencies have been run out of business because they won't place children 
in a two dads or a two moms home. There are suits in California and New Jersey against Catholic hospitals because they refused to perform a hysterectomy, hysterectomies on girls who wanted to trans, translate into boys. And they didn't do it because there was nothing wrong with the organs, but they're being sued because they wouldn't participate in transgender therapy. And then one of the most disturbing things to me is this, the current issue, the current issue of the American Journal of Bioethics. I saw it myself. All these things I have documentation for. The current issue of American Journal of Bioethics has an article arguing essentially this. I'll read you the quote in a minute. Well, I'll read you the quote first. The, the, the author himself says in the first line of his abstract, in this article, I argue that transgender adolescents should have the legal right to access puberty blocking treatment without parental approval. That is to say, if your 10 or 11 year old boy wants to become a girl, or thinks he become, wants to become a girl, and, and you parents say, no, we don't want you to do that. He's advocating that the state override you. And if you won't agree, then take your children away from you. That's what the state is advocating there. Many of you may be familiar with 1987 writing by Michael Swift called The Homosexual Manifesto. It's disturbing reading. He, um, just because of the bullying nature of it, he says that we're going to create a culture of homosexuality, sodomizing boys, destroying family, and turning all culture to a homosexual base, essentially. Some people say it's satire, and it may have been satire. I don't know. I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. But reading it, now, in 2020, from when it was written in 1987, you're shocked at how many things that he predicted have come true. And then one of the shocking statements that he made was, all churches who condemn us will be closed. There's other intolerance from the tolerant crowd out there. Remember when the Affordable Care Act was passed, there was suddenly a, a requirement that every business had to offer health insurance that included all kinds of contraceptive forms. Well, there's nothing wrong with contraception, but there is something wrong with abortion. Some of those supposed contraception work as abortifacients. Well, the Little Sisters of the Poor, a uh, Catholic charity that ministers to elderly poor people, sued and had to spend six to eight years in court for their right not to provide abortifacients in their health care programs. Hobby Lobby sued because they were a religious-minded group, and they finally won at the Supreme Court. The person who went after the uh, Little Sisters of the Poor, uh, as was the spearhead of that for so long, is now uh, nominated to be our Health and Human Services Secretary. The um, Organization of Planned Parenthood doesn't think much of religious conscience laws. Here's what they say from their website. The truth is, no matter what they might be called, these laws aren't being used to protect the free exercise of religion. Instead, they allow religious and moral beliefs to be used as an excuse to discriminate against others. And then the World Health Organization, from their website, lists religious conscience objections as a barrier to abortion rights. They say they're a barrier to safe abortions. Well, there's no such thing as a safe abortion. Somebody dies in every abortion. And they, the World Health Organization, the uh, the, and Planned Parenthood and all these groups are against you and I having a religious conscience. Do you see where this is leading? Anybody with a business that doesn't want to provide abortions in health care is going to be out of business. Any charity, any Christian-based institution is going to be out of business because they won't bow to the demands. And don't you think there are some people that have that agenda? I don't know all their hearts, but you have to wonder. And then there's the issue of censorship. Long before, well, a few months before the recent hubbub about censorship and big tech and all that, I found an article long before oh, any of that happened. I found an article by Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, the basketball player turned activist, in The Hollywood Reporter, in which he says that big tech should censor speech harmful to society. He specified what he meant by that. If you say there are only two genders, that's harmful to society. He specified J.K. Rowling stands that there are only two genders. That's harmful to society. In uh, Tennessee, longtime House member was kicked off of his party's ticket because he supported life, and that wasn't the position of his party. So they kicked him off when it was too late to redo his ballot 
as an independent. He's one of our brothers in Christ, a gospel preacher as well. Lifetime TV this week has canceled the D. James Kennedy show over their stand against abortion. This week, California representatives Anna Eshoo and Jerry McNerney sent letters to broadcasters asking them to stop airing conservative news sites. So you wonder, how soon is it going to be before they tell us to stop preaching in church? It's already happening in a whole lot of countries in Western civilization. You can't preach against homosexuality. And while I'm on the topic, let me make things very clear. If someone has had an abortion, we love you. And God can forgive that sin just like any other sin. We know that you probably were deceived into it by the mass hysteria that goes on surrounding such things. And we love you and we want the best for you. And if someone is struggling with same sex attraction, we love you. Even if you're practicing it, even if you hate us, we love you. We just are not going to agree that that is good and acceptable behavior in the sight of the God of heaven. I'll not want to discriminate against you in any way. So long as it doesn't go against what my duties before God are, you see. So I hope that we can understand each other a little bit better. Who can deliver us from all this? What we're looking at is a suppression of free speech, a suppression of the freedom of religion based on a number of different issues and sometimes a number of different excuses like we've never seen before in this country. And we Christians in this country may see an end to easy Christianity where we have to take a stand, much like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abed Abednego did. What'd they do? Our God is able to deliver us. But if not, we're still not bowing down. Now, what happened to them after that? Verse 19. Then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury, and the expression on his face changed towards Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He spoke and commanded that they heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. And he commanded certain mighty men of valor who were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their trousers, their turbans, and their other garments and were cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and as he rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. Let's stop there. Did you notice what happened? The flames came up and licked up the men who were taking Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the fire. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into the fire. Then Nebuchadnezzar, looking into the fire, sees something that puzzles him. Didn't we throw three men into the fire? He said, true. He said in verse 25, look, he answered, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. I don't know how he would have known what the son of God looked like. Some people have cynically said he's talking about the son of the gods. Maybe the appearance of this, this person was just so spectacularly different than any other human being he'd ever seen. He just knew that this must be divine. It's one of those theophanies, or some people might call it a Christophany. Christophany. Not some people may say that this is the pre-incarnate Christ that's appearing here. At any rate, someone that the king noticed as divine is with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire. Who is able to deliver? Who is the God who's able to deliver you from my hands? He's looking at him now. Verse 26, then Nebuchadnezzar went near the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spoke, saying, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came from the midst of the fire. And the satraps, administrators, governors, and the king's counselors gathered together, and they saw these men on whose bodies the fire had no power. The hair of the head was not singed, nor were their garments affected, and the smell of fire was not on them. 
Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants, who trusted in him, and they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies, that they should not serve nor worship any god except their own god. He talks to them. They've come out of the fire unscathed. And the fire was plenty hot enough, seven times hotter than usual. It killed the guys that took them into the fire. The fourth person that he saw was like the son of God. And now Nebuchadnezzar, the king of the empire, the one that said, who is the God who's able to deliver you from my hands? Says, I've found him. I know who the God is that can deliver you from my hands. And I'm going to do this about him. Verse 29. Therefore, I make a decree that any people nation or language which speaks against speaks anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces and their houses shall be made in ash heap because there is no other God who can deliver like this. Some people might say he went too far. I don't know. That's just what he did. At least he recognizes that God is. He may not have even denounced his, uh, his idols at that time. He did not denounce his idols at that time, but at least he recognizes that God is is and because of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's stand, other people in the Babylonian Empire, other Jews in the Babylonian Empire, enjoyed religious freedom. Maybe sometimes we need to take a stand so somebody else, generations to come, can enjoy religious freedom. Maybe now is one of those times, prayerfully, peacefully, hopefully in Christ, and in his love. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. So their detractor's plan did not work, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were promoted higher. In the New Testament, we have quotes from the Old Testament that remind us that we need never be afraid because the Lord has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. The Lord was with them, and the Lord will be with us. Would you pray with me, please? Father in heaven, we thank you for the examples of saints gone by. I pray that you'll bless people around the world who are in very bad situations. They can be strong through their situations, and that freedom could be obtained for generations after them. We pray that freedom could be maintained here in this country for generations to come. Please work your power and your awesomeness. Help, always, help us always to be sensitive, peaceful, polite, tolerant, but above all, faithful to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you're not a Christian, we'd hope you would be. Christ is then with you if you're a Christian in these days and ages. That was before Christ came, but now God commands all men everywhere to repent and follow Christ. And you do that by confessing a faith in him, that you believe he is the son of God, and that you repent of your sins, confess him before men, and are baptized for the remission of your sins, and then live faithfully to him. If you haven't lived faithfully to him, he's a merciful God who will love you and accept you if you come back to him with repentance and prayer. If we could help you, we'd love to. Let us know. Reach out to us. Well, thank you for watching this morning, Lord willing. We'll have our worship service at 1040 this Sunday morning with the more at-risk folks down at the church building, the less at-risk and more out in the community folks up at the school building. And Lord willing, we'll be streaming this on Facebook from the school building down to the church building and to people who still might not reasonably feel comfortable coming out from home. Thank you for being with us tonight. We hope you have a good rest of the week.